So hello and welcome. Happy Friday. Today is Friday, March the 10th. This is episode number 199 of Backyard Beekeeping Questions and Answers. I'm Frederick Dunn, and this is the way to be. So I'm really glad that you're here today. Storms are sweeping across our country here in the United States, and I am no exception here, although we're not getting as bad as a lot of places are where they would have several feet. We're getting six inches. So it's a good time to be inside doing things like this, although I'd much rather be outside uh, tending to the bees and seeing what's going on. It is March after all. And uh, if you want to know what we're going to talk about today, please look down in the video description below and uh, all the topics will be listed and related links for further information or connections to resources. So how cold is it outside? 32 degrees Fahrenheit right now. That's zero degrees Celsius. The winds are 1.3 knots and they're out of the north. 93% relative humidity actively snowing. And that's why we had the opening sequences with slow motion videos of cardinals and uh, all the other birds that are out there. Cardinals, titmice, the nuthatch, juncos, dark-eyed juncos. All kinds of birds are out there and the bluebirds are here and I learned something over the past week that bluebirds will eat black soldier fly larvae. Who knew? I knew they would eat mealworms, never wanted to buy them, didn't want to go through the bother, but you know what? These bluebirds showed up, they're checking out all their boxes and uh, here they have nothing to eat. They do eat some holly berries from time to time I've noticed, but we put these black soldier fly larvae out there, wouldn't you know what they ate it? So. I know that it has nothing to do with bees, it just has to do with cool things that I'm noticing in the environment. So the questions that uh, I'm responding to today were submitted over the past week. If you want to know how you can submit your own question for consideration, please go to the website, thewaytobe.org, and click on the page that's also titled The Way to Be. There's a form there. You can fill it out. Let's get started. Very first question comes from Gary. It says, hey Fred, being an old fart and low on modern know-how, how would I set up a swarm trap camera for traps several miles away from home? That's an interesting question. So people that are putting out swarm traps, I mean, I get it because it might be a long way off and how would you check it? The problem is um, the ways to check them are pretty darn expensive unless you you know, go out there yourself. But I'm just going to talk quickly about trail cameras. Now this particular one, this is a cheap trail camera. It's by Brownie. Um, and I'm mentioning this because I like for people to know, myself included, if someone's messing with your swarm traps or anything else that you've set out, maybe even your beehives or your apiary, these are trail cameras, they're motion activated, they work day or night, and you set it up to do that. They'll also collect still images or video sequences. Now, I don't own the expensive ones. They're out there, but I'm just going to mention it quickly, and that is there are trail cams that are out there. I recommend Browning. There are lots of, uh, there's Trophy Cam, all these lines out there. And uh, some of them have a SIM card, they need cell service to function and they will send an alert to your phone when there's activity. So the next question is, will these things actually activate for honeybees? So here's the thing. If you want to know if a swarm has moved in, sometimes honeybees do trigger these, but they land right on them. But I've also found out, what if you needed a trail cam that gets really close? In other words, is there even... A trail cam that's like that because these are designed to shoot fields, pathways, rivers, things like that because they're designed to catch big game. Uh, but uh, there's a nature cam that has different lenses that go on it so it can focus really close and you can set the sensitivity to maximum. That means it's going to trigger a lot. But if it doesn't have a lot of tree branches and leaves and things waving and moving around and you build a bracket for this that aims right at the entrance of your swarm trap, then the activity that activates that would be a squirrel trying to get in, a woodpecker checking out the hole, things like that, but also honeybees. And when you check on the footage, you check the sequences, then you'll know if there's active bees there. But you also need to get a video sequence because you want to know how many bees are there and what's the key that would let you know that a swarm has moved in? Pollen. 
coming in the entrance. Now again, I don't have one, but it's the only thing that came to mind if you're going to set something out remote. And uh, here's an idea for you. This is unbelievable, but true. There are thieves in the world. So when you set out your trail camera right behind me on that rooftop there, there's a bunch of different trail cameras. I'm going to link a video that I made that shows a bunch of different options in trail cams because they're different colors and they'll blend differently to the environment. So I never set out a trail camera by itself. I always have another trail camera that's off at some other angle and uh, it's aiming at the trail camera. Why do I do that? Somebody came up and sprayed this with spray paint or did something to it. I want to get a video of that person. So my cameras have cameras. And you want to make sure and do that. That's your insurance policy. Now that's not the one that would, of course, send a call to your phone. That's one that would just be documented so that if you got an alert from your phone and all you saw was a hand going up and knocking out your camera, tearing it apart. I had a bear one time chew a camera. So that was pretty funny. And I got all the sequences and I found the camera laying next to the pond that it was set up next to. But so several miles away from home and you want to be able to check on it. Those are expensive because they're the ones that uh, send out a cell signal, just like a portable cell phone, but they're trail cameras. So I can link one if you want me to. They're easy to search for and just read the reviews on them and see which ones work the best. But if you're low tech, you're going to need somebody to help you set it up. And then when you get the alerts to your phone, you decide whether or not you want to accept that because I think there's a fee, depending on your service, uh, assigned to each and every alert that you get when you respond to it and then you want to view the video sequence or the still images and you set all that up yourself. So that's what I recommend for that. Question number two comes from Bryce. Hello Fred, somewhere recently I read something about the survival rate of honeybees after a sugar shake mite test. It seems a sugar shake might not be as harmless as thought and many of the sampled bees die in the days following the test. Any idea where I may have heard or seen this info? Thanks for your time. Have a great day. Okay, well, no, I haven't read that information, but here's the thing. Here's what I say about that. For those that are wondering, it's a method for counting the mite load on your bees. And if you do it correctly, it's a very accurate way to determine if your nurse bees have a heavy mite load that requires potential treatment. So the sugar shake method. Now here's why kind of I have a question about it when we say, well, so many of them didn't make it after so many days and they were dying after the sugar shake. Number one is, what are your options? So if you're not doing the sugar shake, we know that uh, to get a physical count of the mites on 300 bees is the normal number that we do because that's half a cup. Uh, the other option is to do a mite wash and you can use Ultra B, not Ultra B, Dawn Ultra Free and Clear, or you can use isopropanol. So with those methods, your bees are dead. 300 bees are dead for sure. When you do the powdered sugar roll, uh, that method, if you do it right. So here's the problem I have with it saying that, you know, so many die. It's in the hands of people and therefore the margin of error is also in the hands of the person doing the test. And by that I mean you're after you've dusted your bees with the powdered sugar and you give them a couple of minutes to start grooming. Now you have to take it and shake the mites out of the bees with the um, powdered sugar onto a coffee filter. That's what I do. Um, people shake uh, some more agitate the bees more than others, you know. So when it comes time to agitate the bees and shaking them so the mites fall out, some people really slam them, really shake them, bang them on things. So there is a broad range of how much your bees are going to be bothered by that. So to that I say, we don't know. But the option is killing them all. And uh, if you do the sugar shake right, uh, you really don't have to shake them that hard, but uh, it's a pretty aggressive shaking. So here's another part of that. In fact, while I'm thinking about it, I don't have one of the sugar shake jars here, but uh, this is for your mite wash. So, you know, you get, get a scooper. This gets 300 bees. This is roughly half a cup. You scoop that, you put it in there. But let's say that this is your 
quart jar or your pint jar that you have a screen on for the sugar shake. Uh, I recommend that you put your bees into that first, put the lid on with the screen, then take your couple of tablespoons of dry powdered sugar and you shake it down on top of them. And the difference is if you put the sugar in first, it's in a clump on the bottom and then you dump all your bees in there and then they're on top of the sugar. Now sure they start fluffing it all around because they're bothered. They're being put in a glass jar and they're blowing the sugar around. But when you go to shake it, you've got a clump of sugar that hammers against the bees, right? Until it starts to disperse. But that initial shaking, you've got the physical weight of your clump of sugar that hammers into the bees. So if you put the bees in first, put the sugar on top of the bees through the screen, that breaks it up a little bit, like sifting. And then it's all over the bees and there's no big clump of sugar. So that's one way that you could cut down on some of the impact to the bees. But uh, other than that, I think it's, it's, if you do it right, the sugar shake is pretty darn accurate and most of the bees will live. And uh, I don't know if the study that showed how many of them died or if it was physical injury, right? So any rough handling of bees can cause injury to the bees, especially their abdomen, and can cause their death. So it's really in the hands of the person doing it. But I think the alternatives for mite counts, some people do like to count mites on bottom boards, but that's not accurate. So that uh, indicates the presence of mites, doesn't necessarily indicate the number of mites per hundred bees, which is how you get your percentage, which is what you base your treatment on. Question number three comes from Dahlia in Cork, Ireland. After finding your channel, I listen to all of your older Q&A podcasts, and I still have one important question that I didn't quite get well from your previous answers. I have a forest field nearby that seems to be full of wild honeybees. The field is about 20 meters from my main yard. Each year I put bait boxes to catch bees and it always works. I usually wait till the boxes are fully established and that's a few weeks after the swarms move in. And then moving these boxes to my bee yard just 20 meters away is such a hassle. It's the worst job in my bee work. I usually wait as late as possible in the evening before it's fully dark and then move the boxes to the bee yard. Then, two hours later, I open the boxes and move them into permanent hives. I can tell you, I can't tell you how much stings I get wearing a bee jacket and how far and long the angry bees keep following me. It's a health hazard for my child, and I ask her to lock the doors and windows in the house, and I know you recommend to move the boxes once the swarm moves in. But how do you know they moved in and won't leave if you move the box? After moving the bees to a new hive, do you put the bait box back in the tree, and if you collect something the next day, this will be the same swarm, not a different swarm. So I hang the box back in the tree at night and move it near the hive in the morning. Usually the bees that are left in the tree are collected and moved into the hive. However, even with this, I still miss some bees and they simply die in the tree. You also recommend putting the box back to collect a new swarm. I don't know how would I know it's a new swarm, not the same one, if I simply put the box back the next day. So this is a timely question because swarm season is coming up for a lot of us and we're still well away from that here in the state of Pennsylvania because it's still plenty cold and uh, so yeah there are a lot of reasons why I want you to get your swarm box as soon as it's occupied and move it to your apiary and one of the reasons is they're still kind of in flux and uh, that means that they could go they could abscond very easily but they haven't set up residence which means they're non-defensive one of the things that is described in this question is the fact that they're very defensive because once they set up, they've basically occupied a brand new cavity, which is true, that's your swarm box, and they've started to build comb. They started to install their resources there, so they're settled, which means now they're ready to guard it. When you get a brand new swarm of bees that have just moved in, it's kind of touch and go, and uh, you know they're in there, 
They'll be fanning at the entrance. They'll be uh, the Nazanoff gland. You'll see their abdomens in the air, and you'll see them advertising that this is where they live. It'll become pretty obvious that they're moving in for good, that, they, that the queen is in there, because that's part of it. The other thing is they immediately go to work and try to start bringing in resources and things like that. And uh, the reason I want you to take them away right away is because that's a good time to hive them. Now, if you're concerned that they're going to leave after you put them in the box, one of the great sizes for your swarm trap is a double deep nucleus box. That's 10 frames, deep frames, 5 over 5. So I'm going to show you this nuke that I've showed many times before. <clears throat> this is just the single deep 5 frame nuke box. But one of the features about it so last year we used hives just like this for swarm traps this plus the medium super over it and it's kind of up in the air some people like to put all the frames in i just take the upper box and put five frames in that and then the bottom box is empty so the thing is once they move in because here's the hole and i loosen this up a little bit but here's the hole right here that the bees are going to move in at the bottom and once we see guards at the entrance we see a lot of activity there and we know that a swarm has moved in. You can take these wheels, and that's why I really like them. You turn this down here, and now this is a queen excluder, which means the queen can't get out. So we've got them in this box. So you could actually have several of these boxes. I recommend that you do. Last year I bought a lot of them because I plan on expanding my nucleus resource hive apiary part. Right, so once these are closed up like this, and hopefully your second box is strapped with a shipping strap to make this a single unit, you take this back to your bee yard. You take another box just like it, that's why I recommend you have several. In fact, you can take it with you at the time when you collect these and take them away. And because the thing is, often there are scouts from other swarms looking at the same opening, looking at the same location. And you mentioned in this comment that uh, you know that those are not second swarms, that those are still from the initial swarm. Well, that's because you've left yours for a long time. If you take it right away, I've had swarms move in the very next day with their own queens because often other colonies are swarming at the same time. And uh, people that have even backyard apiaries with a lot of hives in them, You'll notice that you'll get two or three swarms from two or three separate hives all at the same time because we see them bivouacking on different tree branches around. So we know that the triggers for swarming kind of happen to a region, to a zone. So if you're near where there are a lot of feral colonies of bees, the chances of them swarming uh, in close proximity time-wise to one another is very high. So by rotating these boxes quickly, you can get other swarms. Now the thing is, if there are orphan bees behind, like you took that box out and bees were bivouacked overnight somewhere, and then they come back to that site, whoa, and now the swarm's gone, what do they do? Well, bees without the queen will return to the colony that they came from, or they find other swarms to join. So other bivouacked groups of bees on tree branches will pick up random uh, bees from other swarms that can no longer find their queen. So if something even happened to the queen once they swarm out from their hive, they do two things. They either go back to the hive that they left from in the first place because now the queen's gone, or they come across a pheromone stream of another queen. Her queen mandibular pheromone is what they pick up on, and then they just randomly join another cluster of bees that are in a bivouac location while they're looking for a box to occupy. So that's why they're much less defensive when you're taking them like that because they're still in conservation mode and they're still trying to build infrastructure because they've just occupied a new hive. The cool thing is if you take that hive that they've already started in and you have that control wheel on the front and you move it to the queen excluder part, just until you see steady streams of pollen going in because now we know the queen is already laying eggs in her new hive and they're committed there, then you open it back up full bore. So it's a way to control them temporarily to make sure the queen doesn't leave. Because if they want to leave, they found another site that they think is better or they don't like the fact that you move them 20 meters or whatever the distance was and they're trying to go back to where you just took them from. Uh, keeping the queen there will anchor them long enough. Another thing that you can do if you have other beehives 
is once you put them in that box, you can take a frame of brood from another hive at this time of year because swarming is happening, so we make the assumption that other hives are building up. Take a single frame of hopefully capped brood, that would be the best from a really strong colony. Shake as many bees off of it as you can, which is the opposite of what we do when we're making a split. And we take those bees and we put that brood in there and now we have anchor brood. So we have brood that keeps the bees there because they instinctively gravitate towards those capped pupa. And they're going to, as those bees start to hatch out, that's going to keep them all there. So there's a lot of things that you can do. Keep the queen in, keep her there for several days, watch the pollen count coming in, and then you can also prime them with your own brood. In fact, don't even pick a full frame of brood. Pick one that's a partial frame of brood. It doesn't take a lot. It just takes enough to convince them that they need to stay because brood is happening in that box and they'll stay longer. And so I highly recommend multiple brood. There's no reason to shift them immediately into another box. Keep the box that you used for your swarm trap. And in this case, since we had a double, five over five, and we only had frames in the top one, it's the top box that we would now put on another box that has frames in it and keep that as our starting colony. Although I prefer the starting size be five frames. If it's a huge colony, if it's a huge swarm, because they do come in all different sizes, if it's a prime swarm in spring, and it doesn't look like they would fit a five frame nucleus box, then you're in perfect shape for having a five over five configuration to start them off. And that vertical five over five, they build faster for some reason. So I hope I answered that yes, move them right away. Also, I think the second bees that are coming along, if they're another swarm complete, and it's possible that they have been in close proximity to one another. You may have also had it where you collected a swarm off a branch on a tree, hive them, only to come back the very next day and think, ah, oh, they left, look, they're back on the tree branch. But what's back on the tree branch is another swarm from another colony. And so they tend to follow each other's pheromones around. It's very interesting. And I hope at least that's food for thought. Question number four. This comes from Leslie. This says, that was fascinating. It says, thank you. Um, by the way, this was uh, a video that I did to help out a couple that uh, were being attacked by their own bees. One of their colonies of bees uh, had a complete change in personality, let's say. And they were attacked. He was stung more than 50 times while wearing his bee suit. So that's where this comment comes from. It's from Leslie, that was fascinating, thank you. A few years ago, a woman was driving south towards Bisbee, Arizona with her windows down when the bees swarmed her. She died. For people who are out and about in nature, not wearing protective clothing, is there anything we can do to deter the swarm of aggressive bees? I know attacks are rarity, but what if? This is a question, and the reason why this is probably a good thing to answer here during the Q&A is often people think that beekeepers will know what to do. I mean, that couple that contacted me, they didn't know what to do because he went down the road because he couldn't even go in his house. He had so many bees after him, or if he opened the door and went in the house, the bees would follow him in and have a big problem. The bees were killing their chickens. They were stinging their hogs. The bees were on a rampage. So we know that the Africanized bees or bees with a lot of those traits in them uh, tend to follow you not a hundred yards, but a thousand yards. They stay right on you and they don't back off. The other thing is where a colony of bees might send out 50 or 60, which can seem like a huge amount. 50 or 60 guard bees at your face trying to sting you is actually not a lot. When you get a real Africanized colony of bees, you won't be able to see through your veil. That's how many bees collect on your bee suit. So when it comes to the general public, people that are unprotected, bicycling, just imagine people that these road bicyclists, for example, uh, they ride by and uh, they just happen to get near a colony of those bees that has disproportionately sent out its numbers to defend that colony. You don't know what's going on. Uh, one of the stories from years ago Little boys, big shocker, were throwing rocks at a colony of bees that they could see coming and going from a crack in some uh, stone. And they started throwing rocks. Sure enough, the bees came out and they got under trash cans. They were smart, you know, the way 12-year-olds are. 
And they got into the trash cans, but those bees were so angry that they attacked every moving thing they could find. So they attacked a dog, they attacked people walking by, and they expand their radius of attack. So it's a serious issue. And so the problem for those boys that are under the trash cans is how long are you going to stay under that trash can? Eventually you're going to come out and the bees are still going to be hostile. So people should run away. I mean, that's the bottom line. Get as much distance between you and those bees as you possibly can. If you have long sleeve clothes to put on, do that on your way out of there. If you have a car that you can get in, even if bees follow you into the car, close all the windows and everything else because better have just the bees are already with you. They're going to sting you um, than to allow another several thousand bees that might be coming. So uh, again, because once bees start to sting, they're releasing that alarm pheromone that other bees key in on and they'll join in the stinging. And so these are very different from the bees that most of us are keeping here in the northern parts of the United States. Now, the good news is they've kind of watered down a little bit over time. We're not seeing in the news a lot of stories about people being mobbed and killed by killer bees. So uh, either people are avoiding them, they're more out in areas where fewer people are, but uh, one of the things people think to do is run and jump in water. So I don't care what kind of breath hole diver you are, but if you jump in water when the bees are after you and it's nearby where that attack zone is, uh, and you stay underwater, let's say you're super good at holding your breath underwater, and you're under for five minutes. When you pop up again, those bees are going to be all over you again, so that didn't work. The only way that uh, you really have an advantage is if you can find a hiding place or it's near dark, because as things get dark, the bees can't find you. So, I mean, they're pheromone hunters, but they need sight. So as it gets dark, or if you can find a dark space, so if there's a dark area, if there's some kind of dark building without windows, or if there's a cave or something, I mean, I don't know what's in the environment, but uh, getting to a dark space is uh, also a good choice because they can't find you. They can't see well. Uh, but your best advice is to get as much distance between you and those bees, wherever they're coming from. Hopefully you can figure that out and you're not running towards them, like running towards their hive. And, uh, of course, let other people in the area know. Now, the people that are really in jeopardy are those that have uh, sensitivities to bee venom, people that have allergies. Those are the ones that tend to have a real problem, and not just with those bees, but any bee sting. So people that are sensitive to being stung by bees, uh, if they come into an Africanized bee colony and start getting thousands of stings, they're in jeopardy. Their, their life is threatened. So we don't want to alarm people because it's not happening a lot. You can Google it and you can find out how many people have died from killer bee stings. And you'll find out that the number of bee stings that a healthy person can sustain is 10 stings. Now, remember, this isn't going to leave you feeling good, but this is life and death. 10 stings per pound of body weight. So when you start adding that up, that's a lot of stings. Now, that doesn't mean that uh, you'll be feeling great. It just means you're not dead yet. So you are a medical emergency. You are what they call a load and go. So, and there again, EMS has to show up and they have to come and help you out while you're being stung by bees. So we need firemen and we need uh, EMS personnel that are trained. In fact, it wouldn't be a bad idea for emergency medical service personnel to have veils or something to protect themselves if they're in a high area where, you know, bee stings and things like that are happening from colonies like that. But uh, the best advice is, as with anything, when things are going bad, run away, like uh, Monty Python would say. So get more distance between you and those bees, even while you're being stung. I had a nurse stop me in the hall at uh, the hospital and told me they had, that uh, he had seen one of my videos and said that he had an experience like that where his entire veil was covered with bees he could not see to get out of his apiary. So it can be a big deal and you need to stay calm and be deliberate in uh, your actions there. But uh, you're right, the general public does not have that protection. So uh, maybe help educate emergency responders and uh, Tell your friends not to agitate bees. It's uh, people that pick on them for sport, for fun, that uh, get everybody in trouble.
So, and I'd like to know more about the person that was driving through that was uh, stung and killed, if that person probably had uh, sensitivities to bee stings because you're moving in a car. I don't know how many bees can keep up with you for very long on that. So, question number five comes from Christine from, uh, man, I can't even pronounce this, Poughkeepsie, Poughkeepsie, New York. I've been reading about splits and recently read a piece on splitting. Rather than moving a split to another apiary, you can leave the split in the bee yard next to the parent hive. Then, rotate the parent hive with the new split for three to four days to let the population of foragers even out in both hives. Have you ever tried this? Sometimes the backyard hobbyist does not have the luxury of transporting hives elsewhere. My other question is, what is a recommended max on the number of splits from a parent hive if I'm finding 12 to 15 queen cells? So the first part of that is, I don't do that. I know that people do that because your foragers will instinctively go back to the colony that they came from in the specific location that they were taken from. So the thinking is when you do that split, you take that existing colony, you move that to a new spot, and the colony that you're building, you put in place of the old one, and you pull your resources from the old one and you put them into the new box, which is now there. So now your forages are coming back and fortifying that one. I don't do that. And here's why, because I've had great success uh, pulling more resources. Let's just say, for example, let's say there's five frames chock-a-block with brood in the colony that you're thinking about splitting. So it's a 10 frame box, five frames, absolutely full, lots of resources in this hive. I pull three out of the five frames and start my new colony with it in a nucleus hive, which is a five frame nuke. So I put three of those frames in the nucleus hive and I put that anywhere I want it to be in my apiary. I also take the frames that are there and that have uh, brood on them and I shake as many of those bees off onto the one that I'm making, the new one. I shake as many off as I can and that's because those are all mostly nurse bees and of course the foragers find their way back to the other one some may choose to stay with the new one that i'm making the second part of that is i'm taking the queen from the colony that i'm taking my split from and she goes with the new split with the new hive that i'm making and i can put that 10 feet away 15 away the other side of the apiary 30 feet 40 feet makes no difference I know that there's going to be drift and that some of the bees will go back to the original colony. The original colony has that home advantage. That's why I leave them with just the two out of five brood frames. And they do extremely well. And then the new colony, as they're emerging from their capped brood, they're being reinforced right away. The queen is there and she's replacing them and they start building and they do very well. So for me, I don't do the switcheroo because it works so well the other way why upset the apple cart now let's say i wanted to stay open-minded about that and suggest how that might work for you well instead of pulling three out of five frames if i'm going to be taking the new hive and i'm going to put it where the old hive is i would only pull two brood frames and i would take the three out that box and move it to the new location temporary location so see there's too much shifting around because I don't want it there for just a few days and then swap it back to another spot a few days later. I want to do a one and done event on my bees. So I, I leave it. But if you're doing that, then you would only move two frames of brood into the new box and put that in the old location. And then the foragers, of course, would be active and reinforce all of that. And your three good brood frames would be in your temporary new location which again temporary location so we're doing this and then later you're going to shift them again personally don't like it so because now you're going to move them again later and now the foragers you're going to lose foragers from that colony they're going to go back to the original location again too much manipulation it's too complicated for me and the only reason i say that is because it works the other way so why bother i mean like so for example there will be dead outs in spring so I know for sure I have two dead out colonies. So what am I going to do? Barring that there's a brood issue, some kind of disease, I already know that they were too small going into winter and one of them even absconded late in the year and produced new queens. So they were geniuses. 
Uh, so we're going to sweep all those out. Now the first colony I find, it's going to be hard this year because so many of them are already so big and so strong and they're growing so fast and, and the environment hasn't even kicked in yet. I'll be taking frames from those and I'll be creating a split. So I'll take drawn comb from the colonies that died out. I'll pull frames from the colonies that made it through winter that are doing extremely well. I'll pull three of their frames, but they'll likely have six or more frames of brood in those. So I'll pull three of those frames with their nurse bees. I'll put them in the new box. I'll take that over, do, 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 do. I'll put all those frames into the colony that died out and uh, we'll start a new colony that way. And historically that has worked extremely well. Now I have the option with those. I can leave the queen in the colony that I'm pulling frames from if I want to. If they're already building queen cells, however, because that's a reference here too, the colony that's already building queen cells is making plans to swarm. So I take the queen that they have with my brood and I don't transfer any of the queen cells into my new box or into the hive that had the dead out. And I put all those in there and I've satisfied their need to swarm then because the queen's gone, her pheromone is gone. So now they concentrate it says here 12 to 15 queen cells. How many splits would I make? Well, it's not the number of queen smell, <laughs> queen smells. It's not the number of queen cells that dictates whether or not I would make another split. It's the overall resources of the hive. It's the overall number of frames of brood in that hive. Usually I only make one split because I don't do, some people do very small um, colonies. They'll do two frame nucleus hives and things like that. I personally don't do it. I'm a backyard beekeeper. I'm not trying to build a bunch of nucleus hives to sell later. So I'm making five frame nucleus boxes, not twos. So therefore I only make one split from that colony. Now, do I leave the 12 to 15 queen cells? Sure, why not? I don't take any with me. If I really want to frame a brood that's got a conspicuous queen cell on it, one of these 12 to 15, I would have no problem removing that. I want to take away the stimulus for them to swarm again. So when I put them in the new hive with the queen, they're set. Now I just let these do their thing. And uh, most of those queens, uh, the first one to come out, will likely destroy the others. In some cases, even the workers will chew apart some of those cells once they get a queen that they prefer. And the workers in the hive do demonstrate preferences for some of those queen cells. So they don't all make it. So 12 queen cells will not represent 12 colonies of bees. They do that as their own insurance policy to make sure they produce a bunch of queens in the hopes that one of them survives, prevails, matures, flies out, mates, comes back, and perpetuates the colony. That's what they're doing. Sometimes you can end up with uh, a very good healthy queen and you can get another one that emerges a little later. And if the colony population is huge, sometimes there will be an after swarm. So it's the, the, the population of the hive that dictates how many splits you would make. If you open that, that hive and it's springtime and it is bumper to bumper with bees, and loads of brood, you might consider making another split. So you might get two nukes out of it and then keep the queen cells again. And those nukes become your insurance policy. Let's say that three weeks later, you go and inspect that colony that you had to do the split from and you find there is no brood, no eggs, no evidence that the bees, uh, that the queens flew out, were mated and came back. Now guess what? We have an insurance policy because we created two other colonies and uh, one of those had a queen for sure. The other one we're inspecting too. Oh, she got mated and now there's eggs in there too. And so now we just take a frame of eggs and uh, open brood and we put them in the colony that's missing their queen and let them make another queen. That's going to be a weak colony because it's going to take them a long time to produce the queen. Then once she gets mated and everything, we're talking 30 days out before you potentially see a new uh, series of eggs in there and evidence of reproduction. That's where resource hives, nucleus hives come into play. Because not only would I then put eggs in with them, whichever the new nukes that I made is doing the best, I rob them the most. So I might take frame of brood too. It says capped brood on both sides of a deep frame. There's several thousand bees there. 
So I put those in there and now I've weakened these a little bit, but I've resuscitated a colony that went queenless. And it's rare, but if it happens, you're ready. Eight times out of 10, your uh, colonies are gonna requeen themselves just fine and everything's gonna be good. And this is where landing board observations come into play and uh, the beekeeper, how keen you are in looking at the hives and understanding what's going on there. If the bees seem calm and they seem organized and you see a lot of pollen coming in when the pollen's available in the environment, 10 or more per minute, I 99.9% .9 guarantee there's a queen in there that's productive. So and that's in all your colonies. It's when you don't see a lot of landing board activity, you don't see those resources coming in, you don't see a meaningful group of guard bees on the landing board checking and inspecting every bee that's coming back to the hive, that's a colony that you need to look into. So we don't need to inspect all of them. I hope that makes sense. So moving on, question number six comes from Kent, Littleton, Colorado. This is my third year beekeeping and I now have three hives and uh, three five over five resource nukes. So those are good. My question is, do you manage nukes any differently than a full-size hive? My understanding is that nukes are less likely to swarm, but still can. I'm planning to swap out frames in the top box of my nukes with foundation and hopefully keep them busy building comb for me, but I would assume that they can still get honey bound and swarm just like a full-size hive. How do you manage your nukes? Okay. Nukes, short, nucleus, colony. And the nucleus boxes that I use, the one that I just showed you. Um, the thing about nukes is that uh, I play with them because they were nucleus hives. So I started just fooling with them. Uh, you put bees in them. Just like I said, you've got a colony that starts to produce queen cells. I just pull random frames from it. I just sloppily put them together into a five frame, all wood nucleus box, just five frames. And then I put that together, migratory cover. Uh, I started off putting feeders on them, but then I decided, no, I'm not going to do that. I want to just see what they do on their own. And the nucleus colonies built themselves up really fast. Uh, so then I ended up putting a second box on there. When I realized that the brood expanded and that they stored a lot of resources in a very short amount of time, I realized that they're using this vertical space really well. They're very efficient, single entrance. Then, uh, because there's so many bees in there, I had to do a third box. That's my limit. So that's 15 deep frames. That's a great size hive, actually. And then it occurred to me, that's actually a viable real hive, not just a nucleus resource hive. But what I do then is use them as I described before. Now I'm doing an inspection on some other hive and I look and oh look, these, they're queenless. Something's going on with them. They have no eggs or anything. So then I just go over to one of my nucleus colonies. Hmm, which one looks the strongest? Which one has the highest population? And guess what? They all do extremely well. And so I reach in there, do an inspection quickly, assess the strength of that, and I'll pull a frame of honey if the colony that I'm looking at is not well fortified with honey. And I pull a frame of brood and uh, eggs if I need them. And I put them in there and uh, I restore that colony. If that colony is queenless, eggs, let them go, see what happens. And then I pull a frame that's already drawn with comb out of the colony that's weak and I stick it into the nucleus hive and I push their frames of brood together. I never split up the frames of brood and I put the replacement frames to the outside. So the idea, you have to actively keep up with your nucleus hives and that's because they build really fast. And so the other thing was uh, you pull that migratory cover off the top and you find out it's also wall to wall honey up there. So now, we have to keep up with the honey. And so we start pulling honey frames two frames at a time. So we leave free three frames of capped honey in there, centered. And then we put the new frames on the outboard side. So the one in fifth position. And then what they do is they draw that out and they make comb. So now we're using them as a resource, not just for eggs or replacement queens if we need them, but we're also using them to draw out comb and make this extremely valuable comb. In the past, uh, when I was setting up a late season uh, nuke, if I was collecting a swarm or something like that at the end of the year, I used better comb. Better comb is a synthetic pre-drawn beeswax comb. 
and it helped the bees out when they were undersized, small cluster of you know swarming bees that were doomed anyway, so it's a dish effort to put them all together. But now I don't use that very much, and I have it in reserve. I have a box of better comb ready to go. But that was before I started using nucleus resource hives because now they're drawing out comb for me. I'm rotating it out because they're too productive and I have to hold them back. And the way I hold them back is by pulling their resources as they go. So that led me to think that this 5 over 5 over 5 uh, with an insulated top, I do put polystyrene over the top of the migratory cover. And I've left it on summer and winter, by the way. And uh, there are some of my strongest colonies coming into spring. So now it looks like a real hive. But if you leave them alone and you just let them build up like that, I don't know who said that they won't swarm because that is a swarm machine. It is also one of the ways. It really is in line with Dr. Thomas Seeley's uh, Darwinian beekeeping deep in a medium configuration. Three deeps is pretty darn close to that. So what they'll do, so what if they swarm? So here's a, a split in bee management practices. Um, do you let them swarm? Uh, do you head off the swarm? So when you see them making their queen cells, you create an artificial swarm by pulling the queen out and uh, letting them feel like they swarmed. But if you leave them to their own accord, then uh, they're going to swarm and they're gonna replace their queens probably a couple of times a year per colony. Now, if we're looking at adaptive beekeeping or the way bees uh, work out their place in the environment, if you had a colony like that, that you just allow them to swarm and rebuild. Now, this isn't something you would be doing if you live in the city or you have neighbors or you're in an area that cannot sustain feral colonies of bees. Some people would think this beekeeper that allows that to happen is an irresponsible beekeeper. But if you live out in the country and you go to beescape.org and you find out that the environment provides lots of resources for your bees to survive if they swarm, um, then allowing them to swarm and replace their queens several times through the year creates more durable stock. It creates hybridized bees that are adapted to the environment that they're in. And eventually you build up very good stock over the years, season after season, year after year, until you have a pretty well self-sustained apiary that you're making your own queens. And uh, you can control that. You don't have to let them swarm out into the environment. You create more nukes. So when they build up a lot and they have a huge population, you start splitting their brood and resources and creating a new uh, nucleus hive situation. And that's how you end up with rack after rack of nucleus hives, and then you're in a position to help people out that find themselves beeless. And uh, because you end up with just too many colonies of bees. But at the same time, every time you generate a new queen that goes off and mates with drones from your environment, especially in spring, uh, you're finding out that these are great bees for the place that you're living in. They're not brought in from some other place. They're resident bees, they're adapted to the environment, and the more years you keep bees and the more years you cycle back into your own apiary that way, the more hardy your stock is gonna be and you're not gonna be one of those people that goes to a bee meeting and says that I lost nine out of 10 bees, nine out of 10 colonies. You're gonna have bees that uh, sustain themselves very well. So you do have to actively manage nucleus colonies or they will swarm. Now, if you don't mind that and you're in an area where that's fine and you're replenishing, you know, bees and trees and cavities and things around where you live, then uh, that adaptation is accelerated. Kind of the more generations that you have of the bees in your area, uh, the more surviving bees there will be. The more surviving bees there will be. So it is kind of a semi-natural method. That's what Tom Seeley is talking about. Question number seven comes from Paul in Balin, New Mexico. Fred, what is the purpose of the slight taper on the underside of the ears of the top bar of a frame where it rests on the frame in the hive or supers? That is an interesting question. This is a wooden frame. Of course, these were designed by Lorenzo Langstroth. Everything he did had to do with bee space. And if you look at the end, if you look at this ear right here, there is an angle. Across the top, it's perfectly flat. If you go to the bottom side, it angles up. Why on earth would they do that? 
it limits the contact area for um, when you set this in on the rabbit joint inside your bee box. There are deeps, there are mediums, and there are shallow supers. They all have a flat surface in a rabbit joint that this sits on. Because of this angle here, when they sit on that little rabbit joint, it limits the contact area. If the bottom of this were flat instead of tapered, it would sit flat and flush. And then when the bees propolize that, it makes it stick much harder. So by having that little angle there, that uh, limits the contact area and makes it easier for it to pull the frames. Now, when you look at the top of the frame, you'll see that the sides are also camfered in a little bit. Why is that? Now, some frame makers don't do that. But the reason that those angles are on the ears of it too is so that when they're going through a mechanized extraction system, when the racks are going through and they're being processed and they're going down these conveyors and everything, they fit easier into the slots, into the mechanism that moves the frames along. If it were big square pieces without the counter edges and the tolerances are tighter and the opportunity for one of these frames to bind or miss its position is increased. So that's part of production. So a lot of uh, frames that you buy, depending on what company you get them from, they do not have these angles on the end, but that's a commercial beekeeping advantage. Now we might as well talk about the way the end bar is too. So this vertical piece, see how it's nice and wide. These are the spacers, what I call the shoulders here. And that's what I put my hive tool in between and I push it apart between the shoulders because then there's no stress on this thin piece of wood that holds that top bar in place. Uh, some people just put their hive tool right in the middle, twist it, and bow these apart until they pull apart. But these are flat surface against flat surface. If they're heavily propolized, you risk breaking out this little shoulder here. So that's why I always stick my hive tool in there and pry it out. But look, as you get down, it tapers in. Why does it taper in at the bottom? Well, once again, that's Lorenzo Langstroth making sure that the bees, because when these shoulders come together, this creates a wall here, right? So frame to frame to frame, there is no space for the bees to pass through. Aha, uh -huh. when they get down here, the bees can go around the ends of the frame, as well as passing under the frame, as well as passing over the top bar of the frame. So it gives the bees more spaces to move. There's another advantage beyond that. If this were just the same size all the way down the end, not only did we eliminate the ventilation and the physical passage of bees through there, but now we've got a bar that goes all the way to the bottom that could be propolized, and now we have, again, a tougher time pulling your frames apart when you go to do inspections or when you're moving resources around. The other thing is, uh, this would be considered a foundationless frame. There's no foundation in it. Once again, Lorenzo Langstroth. Now you notice that this one has a little wooden spline that goes inside the top. So when you buy these, uh, I get most of mine from Better Bee. They only have one grade of these if you're getting the wooden frames, pine. And uh, so it has all the features in it that would allow you to do anything to your frame that you decide to do. For example, there's holes in the side here so you can run wires through it. So you can have wire reinforced foundation. It also has a groove in the bottom and a groove in the top that in this case has a wooden spline in it, but you don't have to put that wooden spline in there. It could just be the open groove and that allows you to insert a plastic heavy wax foundation in to this wooden frame. So, and Langstroth, the way he designed his, there was a kind of a prism shaped piece of wood. So a triangular piece that mounted to the top of this. And in some cases it was cut from one piece of wood and it had a 60 degree angle that came to a point that followed the center line here. And that was to encourage your bees to utilize bee space, build their beeswax in a nice straight line along that little triangle edge that was created there. And how we arrived at a 60 degree angle for that wedge, I don't know, but uh, that's what he did. And then you can rub beeswax along here to get them started, but I've found that just lining these up uh, properly and having your hive leveled side to side in the most critical way, really side to side is the most critical leveling that you can do. Uh, I've found that the bees tend to build their wax just fine straight down. 
So this is a foundationless frame. I juxtapose these one after another with one that has foundation, foundationless, foundation, foundationless. These are deep frames. They occupy the brood boxes. So you don't have to worry about it being foundationless when it goes in the brood box because you're not going to be harvesting that honey through an extractor. It's not going to get the forces that centrifugal extractors put on medium or shallow super frames. So there are two other popular sizes. Medium frames, shallow frames also. I don't have any shallow boxes. The only one that would qualify as a shallow box doesn't have frames in it because it's for Ross rounds and they have their own Ross round box and their own Ross round uh, frames that go in it. So I use medium frames and the deeps. The mediums are for all my supers except with the nucleus hives that we were talking about before, all three of the boxes have deep frames in them. And for those that have troubles lifting boxes, going all deeps and using nothing but nucleus boxes would make them manageable for you. So there again. And I think the bees use that broader and deeper foundation area uh, better for their brood. So I think it's good all the way around. But anyway, the question was about the ears. That's what the ears are for. I just took a little license there to explain a little more about it because some people may be buying frames. Is wood, another question that I get is wood better than plastic for the frames? Uh, I just started doing it because I liked doing that. Uh, I put Acorn Heavy Wax Foundation in there. Last year I also added Premier Heavy Wax Foundation into them. The Premier was very flexible and easy to install. Um, and the other thing was initially when I started beekeeping back in 2006, um, I liked something called Pierco frames, which were black plastic. They had different colors available, but I had black plastic. The problem I had with Pierco frames, especially on the deep frames, was that the center field of it would flex a little bit. They'd be a little bit deformed, a little bowing and flexing. And one of their engineers, one of their plastics people, uh, left the Pier Co. Um, foundation company and uh, started his own company, and it was called Acorn. And uh, the Acorn company, he was doing heavy wax material. Uh, he reinforced his frames a little bit, and the plastic formula was different. So now, with the Acorn frames, they did not flex through the middle anymore. So as my frames got older, I started cycling out. Pierco frames, and I went exclusively with the Acorn one-piece frames. Uh, inexpensive overall. I never had them break. And I also did stress tests on them in the heat of the day. So I put them in solar wax melters to see how they handled things. So needless to say, I tested a lot of other companies' uh, materials and came out with Acorn as my preferred one-piece frame. So if you're looking at that, uh, there may be differences in personal preference, you know, what you like to feel, hold, use, work with. Uh, the plastic frames did not break apart. I did have some from other companies where the ears on the ends broke and snapped and seemed really brittle. And I won't name the company. I just don't use their stuff. So if I'm saying that I'm using some from someone, uh, I've been using them for years and they work really well. Uh, so the wooden frames that I get are from two sources, actually. Flow sends out frames that are really heavy duty. And uh, then, of course, Better Bee has pretty much one grade of pine stock frames, and they've always been great. Now, I also don't nail my frames together when they're wooden. So if you notice, this is only glued. So I don't have any nails holding that together. Some people drive a nail through the top. Some people drive a nail up through the bottom into the side piece. But I use Tight Bond 3 wood glue. It has a long working time. It's kind of brown in color. It is acceptable for food exposure. So that's a good thing too. And uh, that's all I use. And guess what? I've never pulled apart a frame on inspection. Interesting. So no nails, unless I'm reviewing something for somebody and they require nails as part of their you know, guidelines for review, but uh, for myself, I only use tight bond glue, put them all together, let the glue set, and I've never had them come apart. So, good stuff. Some of you are probably putting frames together right now, getting ready for spring and your very first bees. So that answers that question. Question number eight. This comes from Matthew. I noticed the Apame hives have dividers. Can you split one hive and have two queens? 
Will the bees work on those sides without killing one of the queens? Thank you. Yeah, well, keep in mind, I only started last year with the Apame hives. I have three of them out in the bee yard. I actually did like that uh, they have the opportunity to divide it because one of the things was if you're wanting to start, like for example, with the five frame nuke here, um, I was putting a small swarm in and it uh, was too small to be putting in a full 10 frame deep box. So they have those dividers. The dividers have little wheels on them with vents in the wheels so you can close them. So there's no air passing through between them. And uh, one of the things I did not like, okay, so you create the divider and we've got a five frame nuke in a 10 frame box. So that means you also have five frames on the other side. And I think in their instructions, they want you to use four, but I found that they fit five frames, even with the divider board in there. So now you could have five by five, but the problem with it was, and here's the cool part. I went to the Hive Life Conference in Sevierville, Tennessee, and who was there? The Apame people. So it was great because uh, when you put that divider there and you've got your 10 frame box and if you had five and five and there were separate colonies of bees, look where the entrance was. You slide those entrances open and they came out right next to each other. Now that doesn't mean it wouldn't work. It's just, you know, you're begging for them to kind of drift back and forth to each other, potential for robbing and everything else. But they have a new entrance uh, that he was talking about. And if you haven't seen the video, just Google Hive Life 2023 and the timestamps are there. Look at the Apame presentation because what he did is he showed me all the changes they have coming up for their entrance designs. So now you could have five by five and have that common wall without them passing the pheromone from their queens to one another because they need direct contact with each other to do that. The bees need to lick each other and touch each other in order to pass on one queen's pheromone to the other group. So that would create the stressor. If you have a divider that does not allow them to physically touch each other, this is why double screen boards work because their tongues can't touch, right? But they're sharing kind of a structure, but they're maintaining their separate colonies. And that's what this satisfies. So now you can have the opening for your other colony over at the edge of the box instead of both openings right next to each other. In fact, you could slide them to the middle and have entrances for both your colonies all the way at the opposite ends of the same hive box. But I do recommend, of course, as it starts to build, now their supers that are deep also have dividers. So you can continue that division right on up. You could have five over five over five, just as I have with my wooden nucleus boxes. You could have two of them in one big hive with the Apame configuration. So it is pretty cool and you could uh, keep them both. And I especially liked uh, the changes that they're making. So if you already have an Apame hive and you already have that entrance, it's like that. That was one of the questions I asked. Do they have to get another hive or is this compatible? Are they gonna be able to swap them out for special purpose entrances? And they are. And if anyone knows if those have come out yet, please let me know and we'll of course provide a link. I get no kickbacks from Apame for mentioning them or their equipment, but I liked uh, the opportunity to speak with one of their engineers and uh, to find out how responsive they've been to beekeepers and the feedback. So yeah, you could do that. Separate queens and there's, unless they're mixing it up, my only concern was drift because the entrances were so close to each other. Question number nine comes from Charles. West Layden, New York. What is your opinion of using a uncapping roller punch instead of a uncapping knife? Would this be faster for the bees to reuse? Can the bees still clean the frames in a robbing station? I might be jumping the gun a little. This is pretty funny. I just happen to have one of these rollers right here. So that is what we're talking about. This roller is set up, look how deep the tines are. What you're supposed to do is when you get your super, because eh, beeswax is important, it's expensive for the bees. So the thinking is, and this one's been through a lot of cleanup, by the way, I can tell you right off the bat, I don't personally like these. If somebody out there has had these work well for them and they think they're great, that's awesome too. Okay, so what kind of an extractor are you going to put your honey through? 
So these frames, if it's a tangential extractor instead of a radial extractor, it'll work with tangential better than radial. So this rolls over the top of your frame and it pierces the holes in your capped wax. Now what I found is uh, it misses a couple holes or this starts to get gummed up and now you have to go and with really hot water wash this out. So it's a high maintenance way to go. Um, I found that it took longer to tangentially extract honey from the frames, but you could do it. And then you just had holes in the caps, which means all the cap wax is there. There was no uncapping. There was no removal of wax. It just punches it in. And that means the bees have that to work with. And the other question here was, can the bees clean them up at robbing stations? They sure can, because they get in there and they stick their tongues in there. And if they can't get their tongues in to where they can get a hold of all the honey that they want to, they'll chew right into it. If you've ever seen bees at a robbing station and you've got drawn wax comb out there, they will chew it apart until they get to every little nook and cranny of the honey. So what's my personal preference though? Without a shadow of a doubt, the Pierce Electric Uncapping Hot Knife. for a lot of reasons. One is speed efficiency. The other thing is uh, some people like to have cap wax. They like to make candles and things like that. Some people like to make lip balms and stuff. So uh, they like cap wax. Cap wax is the newest wax in your hive. And the other thing is when you use a hot knife, not only is it quick to do, um, it evens out all of your comb. So you know that when you're maintaining a hive and you've got your, although up in the honey supers, I find that the comb is generally very regular. They match right up. It's kind of in the brood areas where it gets all wonky. But uh, when you've got uh, uncapping knives, that means you're kind of planing it down. It's one move, you know, you're angling it and using the heat to uncap and it all falls into the uncapping tank and you're going to harvest honey from that too. And there you're going to have all this great beeswax. So it gives you an opportunity to collect beeswax and uh, it's much faster and the entire cell is exposed now. So when you put it, my uh, extractor can do tangential or radial. So what does that mean? Well, radial means that the, the central axis and then the frames are coming out from it like this. So this will spin around like this and gravity slings it out this way. And that's because the cells in your beeswax are angled at roughly 13 degrees. So you wouldn't be able to put the top bar of your frame towards the center because now you're driving the beeswax into the cells rather than out. So they sling out because of that cell angle. Um, so tangential I like because first of all, I'm not high production, right? I don't need to put 200 frames through an extractor at once. And it is electric now. I got rid of my manual extractor. And uh, so with the uncapping knife, you get a much cleaner removal right away. And when you put it out at your robbing station to clean up, or if you're putting it back on the same hive you took it off of, cleanup is fast and immediate, and they don't have to chew anything apart to access anything. So you get wax, cleaner frames, even faces, you don't have to match them up in the order that you took them off. So, beyond a shadow of a doubt, and the best uncapping knives I've found hands down anywhere that are going to last you the rest of your life, Pierce. Pierce hot knives for uncapping. And it was fun too because also, back to Hive Life Conference there, the Pierce uh, company was there. They had, there were four people there, fantastic people. The owner was there. And uh, someone, they had an uncapping knife there that was 40 years old that somebody brought in to be refurbished or something. But uh, if you want American made equipment that lasts, uh, Pierce. I am not paid to say that. I get nothing for saying that. I just, when a company makes a great product and it works and it's high quality and everything else, I'm going to promote them. So. Tell them I sent you and pay the same as everyone else. Question number 10. Charlie from Brewster, Mass. I have a five frame double deep and one medium doing quite well so far this winter. I have heard you talk about using nukes as the primary hive before, but have not heard nor seen anything about splitting a five frame nuke. 
in the spring. Could you please give us some of your thoughts on the subject? And so for Charlie, we're getting a lot of questions about these nucleus hives and uh, I see myself transitioning more and more to those. Well, every hive, you know, I have so many hive configurations right now, but I'm just, nukes are fun. They're just pure fun. Just let me say that. Uh, I would not split them. Uh, when we get into spring, again, I use them as resources, which means I'm robbing them. That's, you know, a loose term. I'm pulling frames, resources. If I've got a colony, spring happens, what are we going to do? We're going to collect uh, swarms, for example. Some swarms can build on their own just fine. But if I have a nucleus colony that's abundant, I will take resources from it and start another one. Could I split a nucleus colony? You could. Because they're 5 over 5 over 5. If those bottom two boxes, if you find you've got seven frames of brood, you could create another nucleus. So what you end up with are too many bees. It's a matter of how many bees you want. But yes, you can split them. Uh, you wait till they build up really nice. You have to keep an eye on them because you don't want to go, I don't want to go higher personally than three boxes. They already look like they're too proud to the wind. Um, they could fall over easily. You know, there's a lot of surface area there. You could, of course, um, trap them against each other or create some kind of post next to them that they're they're leaning against or something for strength. But I don't want to take mine higher than three. Uh, so when spring comes, if they're too full, you, you have to start robbing them. I guess you could make splits if you want to um, just go ahead and add them. Now here's just had an idea. So we have three boxes, and the top box is almost always nothing but honey. So we have two bottom boxes, uh, five frame first box, which is where the entrance is. It's probably got a lot of brood on it, but if that second box has uh, a lot of brood, and uh, let's say three or four out of five of those frames has a lot of brood, you could just pull that second box, all the frames out of it pull the whole box out and we have to transfer them because the bottom box is configured with it's got the built-in bottom we have a new version of that coming out with a removable tray screen bottom and stuff like that that's the future for my nucleus hives and uh, so you could pull all the frames from the second box eliminate the second box and create a new colony from that and now you've got a two box uh, residual colony that has to recover from what you just did to it and then when they do that now on the top of that, so above where your honey super is now, as they're filling that out after you've done your split, now you do the third box above that with frames for them to fill and grow. And then of course their brood will expand and start to fill the second box again. So yeah, you can, it's just, everything's vertical, but you can pull the whole box and kick off a new brood that way and uh, control the size of it. Always keep these boxes sized right for the colony that's in them. For example, get a late season swarm that's, you know, maybe the size of a melon, roughly. And uh, you put that in a single five frame box. Don't put doubles to start that runoff. Let them fill all five frames, then add the second box. If you start to add them because maybe you're feeling lazy and you just, I just want to go ahead and put all three boxes on all at one time, works against you. It's weird. They actually slow down production on that. So when they have a smaller space uh, that's not yet full, they fill it faster. More warmth, more environmental control for them, and less space to police and everything else. More bees available to do the jobs in the hive that are pertinent to reproduction and defense of the hive. And then you build it up as they expand, not ahead of time. So, so yeah, you could split them. I don't. I just rob them. I need to stop joking about that because I just keep taking all their stuff and it doesn't work. They build up so fast that it's alarming sometimes how quickly. I think uh, nucleus colonies are the solution to a lot of problems that people have in the backyard beekeeping practice because uh, you can have all deeps. So those of you who are some people go all mediums because they have eight and 10 frame boxes and the mediums are easier to lift. If you go nothing but deeps and only have five frame boxes, you're within range for your ability to lift those. So 35 pounds, if they were wall to wall, uh, drawn comb and honey. So I think that's doable. 
So get rid of those medium boxes and just go with all deeps in the nucleus hives. All of my observation hives will have nothing but deep frames in them. And they're in groups of three, three over three over three over three. So I like that, that tall, narrow configuration, which seems to replicate uh, spaces that they would occupy in nature. Obviously with thinner sidewalls. Question number 11. Let's see, this comes from Matthew in uh, Cumming, Georgia. I'm currently building a long Langstroth hive using the plans that you've created. I hear conflicting reports online where some say bees won't travel horizontally for honey stores during winter. Some say they will, but quite slowly, and some say they do just fine. Can you comment on your experience with how bees feed from their own reserves during winter? Bees naturally, overall, let's say we did a head-to-head -head comparison. Horizontal cavity, vertical cavity. Which would the bees do better in? And I know this becomes polarizing because for some reason people have become married to one type of hive configuration and they will hear nothing negative about it. Horizontal, I'll just say this, horizontal hives work, vertical hives work. Does one work better? Bees naturally, as a cluster, let's keep in mind, what do they do in winter? They cluster together. Now, once they're clustered, what does heat do? Heat rises. We do not have upper vents. We do not have upper entrances. If you do that, that's fine. We don't hate you for that. If you have upper venting and you have an upper entrance and that has always worked for you and you want nothing to do with any other method, that's fine for, for you. But I'm explaining that they create a heat capsule up there. And uh, the heat doesn't vent off through winter, and so they don't have to burn the resources to do it. Dr. Leo Sharashkin came up with, uh, I don't know if he's passing on information or if this is his own research, but that cluster moves up one millimeter a day. Now, of course, there might be environmental issues that uh, accelerate that or slow them down. It depends on how much energy they're burning to increase or reduce their consumption of the honey that they've stored, which is their carbohydrates. But the cluster doesn't have to break apart. In other words, while they're moving vertical, the cluster stays together. They maintain the spherical shape and they migrate over the honey. And as they're migrating over that, they're critical bees. So the oldest bees are on the mantle. They're on the outer surface of that. They're insulating the hive uh, with their bodies. They're insulating um, the cluster, not the hive, the cluster. And of course the queen's in there, nurse bees are in there, the fat bodied winter bees are in there. Everything that needs to be protected is in the middle. So they move up like this basketball, like a, like a really slow moving snail. They don't have to break cluster to migrate over new resources. Now, let's think about that for a minute. Let's go horizontal now. Let's take the long Langstroth hive, which I happen to like a lot. I like the Layens hives too. Uh, easy on the beekeeper, cool for teaching, everything else. So now let's have this cluster. And this is why Dr. Leo, keep in mind, he's a horizontal hive guy, right? But he has solved this problem by having deep frames, knowing they're going to move up a millimeter a day. So you can mark your calendar. How many days do they have above them if they're going to move up like that? So what Dr. Leo is saying is with these deeper frames and the Layens hive has, has worked that out very well frame wise, they're big frames. Uh, they don't have to go, you know, down the length of the hive. They're going to move up. Now I had concerns about that because I was looking at my Layens hives and I was pulling frames and the brood was all the way to the top. So I just thought, oh man, how is that going to work? Those, that cluster doesn't have anywhere to go. Vertically, they're already at the top. They're going to have to go horizontal. But surprise, surprise, who knew Dr. Leo knows what he's talking about. As the late season nectar flow was coming in, what were the bees doing? They were backfilling all those upper frames. And I watched that cluster of bees and the area that they're working and the brood patterns move down in uh, September. 
Then we did this inspection. It's like, oh my gosh, look, a third of that frame is nothing but capped honey all above the cluster. So they do have space to move up. They did not do a lot of lateral movement. Now we have the Langstroth hive. <clears throat> so the Lane's hive, it worked. Lane's hives are heavily insulated, by the way. Now we have the Lane's uh, frame here. It is not very deep. So if the cluster's on here, how much room do they have to move up if it's a horizontal hive? This is the height of everything they have to work with. They have to go laterally. In order to move through frame to frame, see now they're departing that plane that they had before. So now they're gonna, they have to move over it. Remember we talked about the design of this frame. The bees can move over the top of it. The bees can move under it. The bees can move around the ends and then they recollect on the opposite side and they do this. So they can move horizontally as a cluster too. Less efficient than what they were doing vertically. See what I'm saying? What was the reason in the past they weren't doing that very well? Well, because heat was escaping through the top. Had this big gabled top on my long Langstroth. <clears throat> there was a little filter in the gabled end that allowed some air movement, very reduced, but some air movement, which meant that they weren't really building an adequate heat capsule. So in the long Langstroth, what's above this frame? Three eighths inches of space, cover boards. Then above the cover boards, open space. Cover boards now have insulation on them. Insulated hive, much better result. So what did I change that helped them migrate laterally through the year, through winter time? Insulation on the top. Even the Lance hive had very little or no insulation on top. So we used the reflect text, double bubble, seal the joint where the lid comes down along the periphery of the hive so there's no airflow through there. Put Reflectex on top, insulated. <clears throat> and then what happened was they could now migrate laterally and they had the warmth that they needed to break cluster and access honey and uh, stored pollen and things like that to keep going with their resources. And now we have a very large cluster coming out of winter. So <clears throat> both doable is vertical better sure the bees use it easier uh, but both of them work horizontal is not a better configuration for the bees but it's adequate so you can keep them either way so the last question of the day comes from lindy from deerfield virginia hello i was wondering what type of holly you were talking about in episode number 18 I'm needing a better wind break and want to check into those. Thank you. Okay, so that leads me conveniently into my shout out for today. I do have holly on my property. The deer eat it, so I had to fence it this year, which was really annoying. <clears throat> really good for the bees. Great pollinator plant when it's in flower, when it's in bloom. Uh, and the bloom cycle is really long. It's just humming with bees, so it's fantastic. Plus it produces red berries that even the bluebirds eat. So a lot of uh, winter birds need those resources. So we'll do a shout out. <clears throat> the channel is Backyard Ecology and the title of the video is Pollinator Magnet, Holly Shrubs for Native Plant Gardens. And the reason I'm giving a shout out to that individual is he covers lots of different holly bushes and plants, and uh, I think you're going to enjoy that presentation uh, because they're suitable for all parts of the United States. I don't know, there are Chinese versions of holly and things like that, so I'm sure they're available around the world. And uh, I think it would be a great opportunity for viewers to share. If you wanna put a link uh, to some online source for some holly plants that you know for sure yield a lot of nectar and please put what ag zones they're good in. So the ones that I have are good from zones three to seven because we're really cold here, but there are some that are good for zone seven and up. So warmer climates, please share what your favorite holly bushes are and uh, 
that'll do it. I think that's it for today. On to the fluff. Uh, the only thing I have to say is a lot of people are getting concerned about whether their hives are alive and dead and they can't resist the need, the desire to open up their hive and look inside to see what's going on with them. Here's what I recommend you invest in. I know, shocker, that I want you to buy something. <clears throat> Just look them up. Maybe you've got someone that has a stethoscope around. Stethoscopes are cheap. You can take a stethoscope and listen through the sidewall of your hives with it. And if there's a hum, they're alive. Now, if you're just breaking it up open because you just have to know, even in a state of torpor, the bees may not be making a lot of noise. What are you going to do when you open that up? So have a plan. If you're going to restore the fondant, uh, put feed on something like that, we're not in the weather zone yet here in uh, the state of Pennsylvania, Northwest Pennsylvania anyway, where you could put liquid on yet. So if you're trying to resuscitate a colony that's lagging behind, get out there with your fondant or whatever you have and make sure you're ready to put that on when you pull the old stuff off. Don't make multiple trips. So plan ahead. Uh, don't get into autopsying a colony until the warm weather's really here. You'll be shocked sometimes. I'm 99.9% .9 sure that two of my colonies are dead, but I've been wrong before. And when spring came and a really warm day came and I thought the colony was being robbed, because uh, that's the other thing we want to stop. We don't want them to rob out colonies that died. So you want to close it up once you're sure they're dead. Um, I thought they were being robbed and instead the colony was alive the whole time. They were just uh, consuming their resources, staying quiet, hanging out in the corner specifically the southeast corner of the hive. There was a cluster, very small, but enough to make it. <clears throat> so that's the other thing too. When spring comes, if you have colonies that are small and they've used up most of the resources, pack down the colony. If you have extra boxes and things like that still on it that had winter reserves, some people made the mistake of leaving on a super that had no reserves in it at all. Uh, if you can pack that down so that the, the cluster, although they're pretty high in the box right now, but if you can get them packed down more uh, so they have a smaller space to occupy. Uh, on a nice warm day, so what's a warm day? I'm talking 70s and sunny. Just because it's 60s, 60s and sunny and that feels good to you, you can chill the brood. What little brood they have because the smaller colonies have a problem keeping brood warm. They have a problem doing all the jobs they need to do inside that box. And if the box is oversized for them, they have a real challenge ahead. And you could be the ruination of that colony by exposing them just because you need to know. If they're alive, check their food. See if they have resources that they need, the carbohydrates, because what's going to happen next? Lots of rain. And then once the... Um, dandelions start blooming in big patches, fields of dandelions... That's when you better watch your stronger colonies because they're going to take off on you. <clears throat> so listen, use a stethoscope, share the holly, and have a fantastic weekend. Thank you so much for spending time with me and watching. Mm -hmm.